I'm Dr. Elizabeth Clotus. I'm a preventive cardiologist. And if someone had told me when I was in medical school that one day I would start a food company, I would have said they were crazy. And yet, 20 years into practice, that's exactly what I've done. Because along the way, I realized that heart disease doesn't develop due to a lack of the right medications. Heart disease develops due to a lack of the right foods. And yet, no one was addressing this issue. And so I thought, why not me? Here's my story. Now, when I talk about heart disease, what I'm really referring to is atherosclerotic heart disease, the buildup of blockages in heart arteries and frankly, arteries anywhere in the body. And in one way or another, 92 million Americans are affected, 92 million. We spend over $300 billion a year treating this disease and yet it remains the number one killer and disabler in our country, year after year after year. And it's because we're treating the wrong thing. You see, heart disease is almost entirely preventable. You heard me right, it need not exist. And that's not just a wish or an assumption, it's a fact. There are communities around the globe where healthy longevity is not something that's unexpected or unusual, it's the norm. Where people experience 80% less heart disease and 75% less cancer and two thirds less dementia. The biggest difference between them and the average American is nutrition. It's what they eat. And yet, instead of changing what people eat, we prescribe a bunch of pills. That doesn't make sense. I mean, how did we get here? I'd like you to think about this as you're watching the, the video. Has your doctor ever sat down with you and taken a detailed dietary history? Like not just say, okay, are you eating fine? But actually inquire, like what is it that you eat for breakfast? What do you have for a typical lunch? How about dinner? What's a typical snack? What beverages do you consume? I bet most people watching this can say never. And isn't that amazing? I mean, food is a bioactive substance, right? We consume it three, four, five times a day, every single day. Shouldn't that be at least a part of the conversation around any treatment plan? So one of the, one of the reasons why this occurs and that that conversation never takes place is rooted in medical education. From the time I graduated high school to the time I was able to hang up a shingle as a preventive cardiologist was 14 years, 14 years of education, right? about 80,000 hours. And admittedly, there's a lot to learn the basics of, 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 human, of human bodily function, right? Anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, then the organ systems themselves and what can go wrong with them. Gastroenterology, pulmonary, rheumatology, neurology, the various stages of, of, of life, pregnancy and, and OBGYN, neonatology, gerontology, and then because I want to become a cardiologist, a deep dive into the cardiovascular system, right? What's the best test? What's the best procedure? What's the best drug to treat any potential ailment that affects the heart? But if you think about all that education, it's really focused on treatment of disease. And in some sense, it's like what you see in this cartoon. Doctors are trained to mop up the floor. They're not trained to turn off the tap that's causing the sink to overflow, right? We're downstream, we're treating disease instead of addressing what's causing it in the first place. In the case of heart disease, that overflowing sink are risk factors. And there's nine main ones, two of which we can't do anything about family history and age. Those are completely out of control, out of our control. There's seven that are completely modifiable. Inactivity, smoking, and then there's high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes or a high blood sugar, 
excess weight, poor diet. Five, five of the modifiable risk factors for heart disease are related to diet. That tap is food. And yet, how much instruction did I receive on nutrition? Now, I trained at Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins, it, arguably the finest institutions on the planet. I was instructed really, really well on how to mop up that floor. Frankly, I was given a really absorbent mop. Out of those 80,000 hours, would you guess I received 500 hours of nutrition instruction? That's two months out of 14 years. How about 100 hours, a couple of weeks? 10 hours, a couple of intensive days? How about zero? That's right. Over 14 years of education, 80,000 hours, zero spent on nutrition. Isn't that amazing? And it's because we're focused on treatment, on the downstream effects. Like all physicians, cardiologists are trained to mop up that floor. And that, take, and that happens primarily through prescribing medications. Many patients think that physicians are actually paid to prescribe medications by the pharmaceutical companies. That's actually not the case. That's illegal. And if that were the case, it'd actually be fairly easy to solve. The push behind physicians writing so many prescriptions for so many different conditions is actually far more insidious and more difficult to change. For example, a really important component of why physicians write so many prescriptions are the guidelines. So for various chronic conditions, bodies of scientists and, and oversight committees come together to put uh, forward guidelines or uh, recommendations on how to treat various conditions. On the screen in front of you is just one small excerpt of the guideline around how to manage cholesterol. Uh, it was published in 2013 and based upon that guideline actually, over 70 million Americans are candidates for statin drugs, cholesterol lowering medications like Lipitor and Crestor. 70 million. Worldwide, this catches about a million, sorry, a billion people, a billion. Now, the guideline covers everything from who should, who should receive a cholesterol medication, which cholesterol medications should be prescribed, what dose, and these guidelines are sent out to all physicians to follow. It's a cookbook of what we should do. Now, the overall the overall push behind this is actually correct. It's, it's right. You want to have consistent care. You want it to be based on the latest science. You, you, want to re, you want it to be consistent, right? You want to receive the same care in Minneapolis as you, as you would in Phoenix. The problem is these guidelines don't just go to physicians. They don't just, they're not just suggestions. They're actually also sent to insurance companies and quality rating agencies that look at your prescription patterns. Are you following the cookbook? If you're not, you're fringe, right? Why aren't you prescribing statins to every single patient you see? Why are you talking about broccoli? And here's the amazing thing. There's actually no requirement in this guideline for me to talk to you about nutrition, even though we know that diet is one of the principal things affecting your cholesterol numbers. The result, waiting rooms full of people who look awful and feel terrible, but have perfect numbers, right? They're all treated to gold. They're all being, they're all being treated according to guidelines. They're on the best medications to treat their condition. And yet, no one is experiencing a cure. And this is what struck me. I mean, I went to medical school to cure people, not to create a never-ending revolving door of follow-up visits. And this is where I started to really ask about diet and nutrition and really delve into the cause of disease. I have to tell you, though, that going that route, getting into the, you know, going after that tap, trying to turn off the tap, is not necessarily without its perils, right? Don't follow the guidelines, bad doctor. 
right? Talk to your physician, talk to your patients about apples instead of statins. Your colleagues start to look at you askance. Even though the data is so clear that apples are actually superior to the statins. This is the amazing thing. The science tells us that nutrition is superior to pharmaceuticals. For example, if you look at risk reduction related to statin medications, right, it's significant. If you take a statin, your risk of heart disease is reduced by 30%. Wow, that's pretty significant. Do you know what the risk reduction is from changing diet? It's 40%. Food is better. And if you think about it, it makes total sense, right? Because when you change diet, you're not only addressing cholesterol, you're also addressing high blood pressure, you're also addressing high blood sugar, you're addressing obviously poor diet and excess weight. Food is a comprehensive solution to a complex problem. And the best part is it comes with no side effects, just side benefits like lower cancer rates and less dementia. Food is in fact so powerful that it can help reverse disease. On the screen in front of you is a picture of an angiogram from the same patient taken three years apart. On the left, what you see is, is area of blockage in one of the arteries, the left anterior descending coronary artery, which happens to be actually the most important heart artery. On the right is that same artery about three years later. What was the big intervention? Well, it wasn't a stent, it wasn't bypass surgery, it was a change in diet. Food can help reverse disease. And if you think about it, that also makes sense because our bodies are programmed to survive and thrive. If we just give it the right support, it will reward us. Now, I'm not here to promise this type of result to, to everyone, but look at what's possible. Wouldn't we want to leverage this as part of our own care? So why aren't we all doing this? Why are we all eating right to reverse disease, to help our medications work better, to treat every aspect of our chronic conditions. Because that diet part, it's hard and it's confusing, right? Eat eggs, don't eat eggs, eggs are back. So is butter. Wait, don't eat saturated fat, which is butter. Actually, just eat lots and lots of protein. No, wait, be a vegan, no, wait. It's very confusing. And here's what I would tell you. It doesn't work, right? If all of these different diets worked, we'd all be thin and healthy, and we're not. What does work? It's what those people that live long well do. Right? They eat a whole food plant-based diet. Beans, greens, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, grains, but in their most whole and unprocessed forms. And this is really important. It's really about the whole food. There's something really, really special about eating whole foods, not their derivatives, not processed foods, but whole foods. So eat steel cut oats, not Cheerios, right? Steel cut oats is the whole oat grain cut in half or in thirds so we can begin to digest it, but it's the, it's the whole oat grain. You put a whole oat grain in the ground, you get a plant. That, that grain, that seed, has everything needed to support life. Wow, that's amazing, right? There's no amount of Cheerios you can put in the ground and get a plant. Something is missing. And no matter how reconnoitered, fortified, puffed, crispy, and delicious it is, it can't support life. So always eat whole foods. Now, if you look at the people who live long well, most of them are way on the vegetarian, even vegan spectrum, but not all. So it's not about eating only vegetables or, or only plants, but primarily a whole food plant-based diet. 
I spent a long time teaching my patients about this, sending them to the grocery store, having them start cooking from scratch and, and, and avoiding you know, pre-cooked pre -cooked meals at the restaurants because I, because I thought they could do better if they cooked for themselves and, and, and shopped and, and had more control over their foods. And what I realized along the way was that when I was sending them to the grocery store, actually wasn't sending them to a safe place. I was sending them into the Wild West. All these packages, everything calling out, you know, a, a health benefit or, or some sort of improved nutritional profile. And I frankly have to tell you, a lot of it is a lie. For example, take a look at the ingredient list of, of this particular product. And I'm not picking on, on, on this particular product. It's just the, the, an, an illustration of how things have gone wrong in, in the grocery store. So we all know that we need to eat more fiber. Most Americans get about half of the fiber that, that they need. Well, here's a bar that says, hey, if you eat me, I'm going to supply nearly 10 grams of, of fiber, which for most people gets them to about where they need to be for, for their fiber intake, or at least pretty close. Pretty simple, one bar. But if you're a savvy label reader, what you'll see is that the very first ingredient on this bar is chicory root extract. Sounds pretty good, except it's another name for inulin. Inulin is an added fiber. Yes, it's natural, but it's not an integral component of a whole food. It's an added supplemented fiber. And it turns out that all the data on the benefits of fiber and, the, and their health rewards are derived from studies that have looked at the intake of whole foods. So it's not just the fiber itself, it's, the, it's the, the delivery vehicle in which it comes. On top of that, the, the chicory root um, extract or inulin is a short chain fiber, which means it's prone to fermentation in the digestive tract. There's actually people who can't tolerate this additive because it, it results in so much digestive upset. Okay, but even if you can tolerate um, inulin, even if you, if you accept the fact that its greatest benefit is going to be more on regularity than, than improvement in overall health and, and, and reducing heart disease risk, look what you have to eat to get this fiber. I mean, if I look at this nutrition, uh, sorry, this ingredient panel, you know, I count added sugars appearing six times. Frankly, the only ingredient worth consuming is just one, the whole grain oats. As a consumer, this shouldn't be so hard. You should be able to walk through any grocery aisle, put any product on any shelf into your grocery cart and feel good about it. And yet it's this hard. It's so complicated that it's, that it's you know, that frankly the, the, the odds are stacked against you to make good choices. Here's another example of what's wrong with the grocery store. There's all sorts of claims about you know, reduced sodium, less cholesterol. Okay, what does reduced sodium mean? It actually means 25% less sodium than what was in the original formulation. So first, just stepping back, how much sodium should you take in? Well, the recommended amount is under 2300 milligrams of sodium per day. That's the equivalent of a teaspoon of salt. And that's supposed to last you the entire day. It's actually not that much. If you have high blood pressure or prehypertension, your intake should be under 1500 milligrams of sodium. To put all of that in perspective, in primitive peoples and, and you know, hunter-gatherer societies that are still you know, present on, on, on our planet where hypertension is frankly unknown, their sodium intake is under 500 milligrams per day. So any grain of salt we add to food is actually salt we don't need for health. So minimizing sodium intake is important. And so, doesn't it make sense that you'd want to search out products that are reduced in sodium? Of course it does. That means you're trying to do better for, for your health and, and for your blood pressure control. But here's the trick, right? 
where did that sodium content start? 25%, if you started off with a, with a high amount in the first place, actually doesn't help you all that much. For example, in this case, the starting point was 870 milligrams of sodium per serving. So 25% less, okay, well that's still 650. That's more than the entire daily intake of the, you know, of the Aborigine. It's about a third, at mo over a third of the way if you have high blood pressure for one serving of soup. And who's kidding who? That can makes five servings, five cups. Chances are you're probably going to consume more than just one-fifth of what that whole can makes. And don't get me started on the check marks and seals of approval. You know, you see those all over different products and it, the assumption is that they're there to help us make better choices, to actually choose foods that support heart health. Well, in that case, you know, why don't you see a check mark on every apple, every bunch of carrots, every box of barley? Because those seals and check marks, it turns out, are bought and paid for. Companies can put them on their boxes with, with a check made out to that, the, the, the purveyor of, of the seal. Now, there are nutritional benchmarks that, that the products have to meet, but they're actually not that stringent. Otherwise, why would you have a heart check mark on a serving of beef or a can of soup that contains 600 milligrams of sodium, even though the FDA defines a low sodium product as having less than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving and even though the American Heart Association you know tells us every single day to eat less salt eat less salt eat less salt doesn't this make you mad it makes me furious and what I realized as I delved deeper and deeper into this nutrition quagmire was that my pa there was nothing I could recommend to my patients that I could trust, that they could trust, and that really no one was going to solve this. Right? Why would pharmaceuticals change the way things are? They're doing great, you know, with physicians prescribing drugs all day long. Why would they want to help us eat better? Why don't they want to let us know that food can be more powerful than the products that they manufacture? food companies, why would they do it? They're happy having you purchase products that you think are good for you because they have all sorts of seals and check marks on them. No one was going to solve this. And so what I realized was that there was literally nothing I could trust that I could point my patients to. Sure, I could tell them to go ahead and, and just shop the periphery and cook everything from scratch. And what I would tell you is the people who did that, they had amazing health results, right? Medications less shrink, diagnoses melt away, patients becoming non-patients. It was the first time, frankly, I was curing anybody. But here's, here's the reality of it. The people who could actually do this were so uncommon. They were unicorns in my practice. And what I really needed was something that was practical, that was actionable, that I could credibly recommend that would improve my patient's health and yet be super easy to do. And this is where step one foods arose. It really came from a clinical need to help my patients achieve their best health, not just through drugs, but also through the fundamentals of nutrition. And here's the great part. It's not about this giant change. Yes, the people who had the giant change also had giant, um, giant um, responses, but even small sustained changes can have a amazing impact on your health because food is so repetitive, it's so cumulative. So just as poor choices can drive us into more 
disease and more health, health issues, making better choices can drive our health in the other direction. And the, the reality is, and the truth is, we know what to eat. We know what to eat. The science is there. The data is there. We just don't do it. And so Step One Foods was really the culmination of both my clinical experience, my education along the way, and things that I taught myself. Because like I said, I had zero, zero hours of nutrition education. I had to learn all of this myself. I had to really dig into the data. And it turns out, here's what I realized in my own practice. What people were fundamentally missing from their diets was whole food fiber, antioxidants from fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, those omega-3s, and plant sterols, which are natural plant components that help reduce cholesterol absorption in the digestive tract. People who are vegans and vegetarians get tons of those. Most of us don't get nearly enough. And we know even how much of these to eat. Turns out adding 10 grams of whole food fiber to our diets reduces our risk of experiencing a heart attack by 14%, by dying from heart disease by 24%. Well, guess what my goal was when I developed Step One Foods? To make sure that they delivered at least 10 grams of whole food fiber per day. I can go on about omega-3s and plant sterols and antioxidants. The data is all there, and that's how these foods were formulated to make sure that clinically relevant amounts of these nutrients were delivered to you in a very simple, twice a day food substitution. Because again, food is cumulative, it's repetitive, and a small sustained change can yield giant health results. For example, take a look at what happens if you just switch out what most people would consider a fairly normal intake of a plain bagel for breakfast and a regular Snickers bar in the afternoon. Okay, maybe not the healthiest of choices, but not completely egregious. A lot of us, including myself, have a bagel from time to time and, and a Snickers bar. Well, what if you switch that out regularly over the course of a year? Well, here's what happens. You will take in 180 less calories a day over the course of a year, that translates into 18 pounds of weight loss by doing nothing else, just making that small little change. When it comes to sodium, you'll take in a cup less salt. Wow, that's a lot of salt, right? That's a whole container of it. And you'll take, you'll add in uh, the antioxidant equivalent of 150 pounds of kale. Now, I don't know about you, I can't even conceive of eating 150 pounds of kale. It would probably fill my entire kitchen. And yet, this is what can happen when you make a small sustained change with products that were actually developed to help build health. You can also do this yourself, right? Think about small sustained changes you can make today that are not that hard to do, but will yield marked health benefits over time. My favorite examples are apples and soda. A can of soda a day doesn't seem like much. I see lots of patients that for them, two, three cans of soda a day is just a regular thing. Well, one can of soda a day translates to 30 cases in a year, 30 cases. You ever think of going to Target or Walmart or Costco, buying 30 cases of soda, putting it in your kitchen and saying like, yep, I'm going to drink that today. You think that's crazy. That's not good for you. And yet, over the course of a year, that's exactly what one can of soda translates into. Right? Eliminate one can, it's a health transformation. Same thing on adding something good in. Right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Right? Then one apple over one day, yeah, kind of lame. Not, not much happens. But what would happen? if you added an apple every single day for a year. That's three bushels of apples that you've added into your intake. That's a lot of fiber, antioxidants, micronutrients, really interesting nutritional components that you've just added into your body. And what if that apple was a trade out for a cookie that you habitually eat in the afternoon? 
wow, that's a health transformation. Again, it's that power of sustained small change. And this is where step one foods is really, you know, focused on is to help people improve their health without turning their lives upside down. You don't have to become a yoga practicing vegan triathlete to obtain a health improvement. We've proven it. Just even in 30 days, you can see a significant measurable health result by making small changes in your diet. Now, we don't pretend that step one foods is the entire answer to everything. That's why they're called step one, not step one to 100. But it's a place where you can get started. Products you can trust that were formulated specifically to help you improve your health. Let me share with you the five things I wish every patient knew about heart disease and their health. Heart disease does not develop due to a lack of the right medications. Heart disease develops due to a lack of the right foods. So eating well can help stave off the number one killer and disabler in our country. Now eating right does not have to be hard, right? You don't have to become a yoga practicing vegan triathlete to experience health benefits from dietary change. It's the small sustained changes that yield marked, measurable, foundational health changes over time. Always ask your physician about nutrition in the context of your care. Right? Any chronic health condition you have can benefit from support from the right foods. Not all physicians are versed in nutrition, and that's okay but they should be willing to refer you to a professional dietitian nutritionist that has that knowledge. It's really important. Medications are only part of the solution. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean they're all dangerous, but they're incomplete without that, found, that foundation of the right diet. Food can actually be more powerful than medications in helping you solve your health issue. For example, right, the risk reduction from being on a statin medication, medication like Lipitor or Crestor, results in about a 30% reduction in your risk of heart disease. What's the reduction associated with changing diet? 40%. Food is a comprehensive solution to a complex problem. We have a lot of power over our own health. Remember, no disease is preordained. We are programmed to survive and thrive. Give our bodies the right nutrition, the right fundamentals, and it will reward you.